When evolutionists try to discredit the concept of irreducible complexity, they go out of their way to avoid the topic of sexual reproduction. If evolution were true, sex should not even exist, as it is far less efficient and effective than asexual reproduction. Having to find a mate is just one more barrier to reproduction. Compounding that, should you happen to have the rare beneficial mutation, your chances of passing it on are diminished because sex shuffles genes as well as your brain. How could sexual reproduction evolve from asexual reproduction? All of this had to occur in one step. It could not evolve in gradual steps over time. So why can't these supposed scientists admit they have no explanation and no proof for the evolution of sex? I had to investigate. In addition to metabolism, inheritance, and reaction to stimuli, reproduction is one of the definitive characteristics of life. As I discussed in episode 10, in 2014, Jonathan Chapanzi and Gerald Joyce were able to show that even without a cell, RNA chains are able to reproduce and evolve by selecting random chains. In the process of their experiment, these chains continued to become better and better at reproducing. This work serves as an analog for the earliest nucleotide replicators and shows that reproduction is not exclusive to life. Even without genetics, between 1965 and 1972, Sidney Fox and others submerged amino acids and proteinoids in water and saline solutions and then heated them, yielding microspheres which also began asexually dividing via binary fission. They even developed a double membrane corresponding to a bilipid layer in a living cell. Using a fatty acid bilayer and later a phospholipid bilayer encapsulating genes, basic prokaryotic life essentially incorporates these processes of asexual reproduction. In very simplified terms, the genes duplicate themselves, migrate to opposite ends of the cell, and the outer membrane divides, resulting in two nearly duplicate cells. This process is known as mitosis. In the midst of this, prokaryotes have several methods of modifying their genome. Transformation, wherein a DNA molecule is taken up from the external environment and incorporated into the genome of the recipient cell. Transduction, wherein a bacteriophage transfers genetic material from one bacterium to another, resulting in an addition during recombination. And conjugation, wherein temporary direct contact between two bacterial cells leads to an exchange of genetic material. In this way, genes are transferred laterally amongst existing bacteria as opposed to vertical gene transfer in which genes are passed on to offspring. In all of these cases, there is a single copy of the genes, referred to as a haploid cell. The genomes of many eukaryotes are also modified via these methods, but sometimes two eukaryotic cells can unite during a lack of resources, resulting in a single cell with two genomes known as a diploid cell. This type of cell fusion was observed in 1998 by John Davy and individuals of the Brewing yeast, Schizosaccharomyces pombae. Published that year in the December 24th volume of the journal Yeast, both genomes are reproduced in their entirety but with a degree of mixing during the process of recombination. When resources are more plentiful, the diploid cell then divides into four asexual individuals that continue to divide. The two similar genomes allow for a better preservation of the genome by eliminating deleterious mutations. This is known as homologous recombination and is a very basic example of what is called outcrossing, or what most of us refer to as a basic form of sexual reproduction, but with nothing that we could recognize as genders. In 1993, Stuart Kaufman published The Origins of Order, Self-Organization and Selection in Evolution, hypothesizing that merely from a statistical view, reproducing polymers will inevitably become selective toward functional enzymes, essentially that new structures can arise from random sequences. This hypothesis was confirmed in 2006 by a team led by Tetsuya Yomo who infected several phages with random gene sequences across roughly 120 sites throughout their genome. After 20 cycles, the modified phages showed an increase in fitness of up to 1,700 times the initial population. Published in the December 20, 2006 volume of PLOS One, it gave the mechanism by which new structures to enhance reproduction production occur from previously existing structures and genetic sequences, including the specialization of tissues. Multicellular and colonial life can develop cells that are specialized for reproduction. Known as gametes, they essentially carry out the process we just covered but on behalf of the entire colony or organism. There are numerous living examples of this today, but a very common one is in vulvacine algae. 
Also known as Chlamydomonodales, species in this order vary from unicellular to multicellular and from obligately asexual to sexual reproduction. In 2014, a team led by Hisayoshi and Osaki observed the formation of differentiated gametes in two species of Volvox. Instead of two cells conjugating, one colony developed a small spindle-shaped motile cell which injected itself into a larger, more bulbous gamete retained within another colony. This is a very basic example of male and female sex. The the advantage of outcrossing has been demonstrated several times using hermaphroditic animals. An example of the benefits of sex came in 1987 when Curtis Lavely published his observations of New Zealand mud snails. In this species, the females are able to reproduce sexually or asexually via parthenogenesis, creating only females. What he noticed was that in populations with a higher number of parasites, there was a correlating increase in the number of males. Since males can only be birthed from sexual reproduction, this is an indicator of the amount of sex that had been going on. The population of non-sexual snails was simply unable to survive among the parasites Parasites, while the variation caused by homologous recombination and sexual reproduction produced parasite-resistant snails, essentially showing that the presence of these parasites correlated to a proportional increase in fitness. This has been dubbed the Red Queen Hypothesis after the Red Queen in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, who finds herself running faster and faster just to remain in the same place. To further explore this concept, in 2009, a team led by Levi Moran isolated two populations of the worm Chenoraptidus elegans, one being the control group in a petri dish with no parasites, and the other with the parasitic bacteria Serratia marquescens. After 40 generations, the nematodes with no parasite were observed to reproduce sexually 20% of the time, while the population with parasites reproduced sexually 70% of the time. Going further, the team isolated three more populations of C. elegans, one being the control group, and the two Two others with genetic modifications. The first group could only reproduce by self-fertilization, and the other could only reproduce via outcrossing. All three populations were placed in petri dishes on one side with food on the opposite side. In each dish, between the worm and the food was a barrier of vermiculite. From there, it was just a matter of observing the worms navigating the barrier to reach the food on the opposite side. When they did, the worms were then relocated to new petri dishes with the same food and obstacles. After doing this 50 times, the worms that had been only able to reproduce sexually showed a profound increase in fitness, while the worms that could only fertilize themselves showed a noticeable decrease in fitness. Published in the journal Nature, further studies showed an even more rapid disparity in fitness when a mutagen was introduced to increase mutation rates. Essentially, sex allows for the best mutations to proliferate. So the benefit of sex is irrefutable. The mere reshuffling of genes allows more diversity in a population, meaning that if the right beneficial mutation occurs, increase in fitness is a virtual certainty. From there, the development of gonads is a matter of tissue specialization. As covered in episode 54, in 1983, Martin E. Barras subjected a culture of the unicellular blue-green algae, Chlorella pyranoidosa, to a a highly predatory environment. In this experiment, the chlorella tended to clump together into colonies, making them too large for the predator to ingest. Eventually, members of some colonies began specializing in certain duties like reproduction or even nutrient transport. Now referred to as chlorella vulgaris, this species showed that specialization of tissues can develop over a very short amount of time. Far from being irreducibly complex, sexual reproduction does not require genitals, it does not require genders, and it doesn't even require gametes. For all the difficulty involved, it actually is responsible for an increase in fitness of a population. And regardless of all the adaptations humans have, each one of us is still merely the result of the fusion of two haploid cells that continued to reproduce asexually until they eventually developed into our adolescent or adult cells, only to start the whole process over again if we get lucky. It is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.